welcome from across this gorgeous planet. We are one church, many paths, one mountain, where our mission is what Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Goffney call the planetary awakening in love through a unique self symphony. Together, we declare that the last day of the old face of evolution is honored as the first day of the new face of creation. I am Christina Tahal, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josepha and Kirsten Zohar, and I am delighted to be here with each and every one of you today. I welcome all the new people. Please do share that you are new in the chat box. We want to hear from you. When you do chat, make sure that your chat settings say all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists. Use the chat function to say hi, to let us know where you're from and to resonate the Dharma. In one church, many paths, one mountain, we are connected, we are whole, and we are expressions of the entire process of creation. We are activating a new humanity and we are awakening as a new species. Homo amor, the fulfillment of Homo sapien. We are a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a zendo. We are all of it. No one is excluded, everyone is included, and we come together to attune to the evolutionary impulse awakening within us. Welcome home, everyone. We are overjoyed to be with you personally today in week 203. Let everyone know about One Church, Many Paths, One Mountain. We are doing this primarily through word of mouth. And I can say that leadership around church is a sacred opportunity. On YouTube, we are One Church, Many Paths, One Mountain. On Facebook, we are facebook.com forward slash onechurch.world. And right now we are streaming live on YouTube and on Facebook. So take a moment, copy either of the links from the Zoom chat box and share those live links on your favorite social media channels. After church, we will send you an email to invite your friends and family. And go ahead and forward that email right after church. Spend time on our website, www.onechurch.world. On the top menu of the homepage or the bottom of each page, you will find our membership link. With that, I give you a little bit of what to expect over this next hour. We begin with a Dharma recap, then Dr. Mark sets our intention, then David resonates the evolutionary love code we are working with. We move into prayer, then evolutionary sermons with Dr. Mark, and often with a piece from Barbara Marks Hubbard. Then Krista invites us to commit our outrageous acts of love and to contribute our gifts to this revolution. And today, actually, we're going to bring everyone on for a post-church meeting about our vision for this next year. So do stay around for that. Mark wrote what he called evolutionary love codes. Mark and Barbara studied the codes together, often comparing them to Barbara's own 52 codes for conscious self-evolution. These codes grew out of their radical commitment over 100 collective years, crystallizing the new story of humanity. Quote, evolving the course of consciousness and culture, which is the source code of love. Each church is a standalone and every week's church builds on the week before. One church, many paths, one mountain is radically committed to telling the new story. So here goes my Dharma recap from last week's church. Prayer. The personhood of cosmos, restoring the dignity of personal need. 
Prayer is a first principle. Prayer is a first value. First principles and first values evolve the source code and participate in the evolution of love. First principles are needed for the envisioning of a new human and a new humanity. We must bring prayer back into the center of society to actually wrest the hijacking grip of fundamentalism on prayer, which understands prayer as a kind of cosmic vending machine. Prayer is not a cosmic vending machine. Prayer is an ask where we must bring all of ourselves we need things and prayer affirms the dignity of personal need. Our needs are real and beautiful and holy and prayer affirms them. Homo sapiens has climbed and climbed and become an apex predator in the win-lose metrics of the success story. We now feel the call of the imaginal cell that wants to turn the caterpillar into a butterfly. One text of the interior sciences, the Zohar, calls the three persons of God, Ani, Ata, Hu, I, you, and he, she, meaning first person, second person, and third person. God in the first person is she who lives in me, Ta bam asi, thou art that, the infinite nothingness lives in me. God in the second person is the personhood of cosmos, cosmo erotic humanism. Reality is the infinity of intimacy that knows my name. Every thought, every gesture, every flutter, every fear, every fantasy, every glimmering of greatness. God in the third person is the evolutionary impulse, the forces of physics, the galactic powers that form stars, supernovas, the incessant self-actualizing, self-organizing creativity of cosmos manifesting myriad complexity, dazzling beyond all imagination, that we faint in rapturous ecstasy. God in the first person, God in the second person, God in the third person are all part of the one. When we pray, we ask for everything. We are participating in the larger field of cognition, the larger field of intelligence. Love evolves and it becomes us. We are part of a system. Our intelligence doesn't live just in us. It's accessing all sorts of inputs and it's animated at every second by the larger systems of intelligence and love. We live in a world which has pan interiority. It's interiors all the way up and all the way down. The nature, the feeling of this interior is intimacy. Every it is actually a thou. It has an interior, it's alive, it's pulsing, it's yearning to touch and to connect. We are ready to become part of the new DNA of the new human and the new humanity. We are a band of outrageous lovers and we are committed to being revolutionaries. We take upon ourselves the burden, the joy, the ecstasy and the responsibility to know that reality needs our service and that prayer is kissing the lips of the infinity of intimacy who knows our name. With that, I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred space of one church, many past one mountain. And I turn my word to you, beloved Dr. Mark. And well, you know, Christina Amelon, we have to all unmute ourselves. And we have, are we ready to unmute ourselves? Let's all just unmute our hearts, right? Because we need all of our voices. And my beloved friend, Mosa, 
but at some point, right, there's going to be a moment where she's going to step in and she's going to put together a bunch of conversations we've had with some of her wisdom. And we're going to have a little essay on unique voice. And every unique voice is needed. No unique voice is extra. So welcome, everyone. And it's just a crazy delight to be here. Now, thank you for like the most beautiful Dharma recap, Christina Amlon. And, and I want to just, you know, step in for a second and to get this notion of not taking it for granted. So Christina Amlon used exact words from the first principles we're establishing, but she, she listened once, twice, three times, right, to everything we talked about last week, and then rewove sentences in a new order and gave us a fragrance, a touch, right, of last week in which each of her sentences mattered, reweaving the order, right, and sharing with us so we could actually, in this insanely gorgeous, necessary, urgent, ecstatically urgent, utterly necessary adventure we're on, right, in this adventure, we could actually, this adventure that's necessary for the survival of humanity, necessary for the thriving of life, right, on earth, and probably life in the universe, right? Christina said, okay, we need to know what happened last week so we can have a continuity. And I'm gonna step in, where I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this Dharma recap. And, you know, Lisa did Dharma recaps before, Christina Tael, and then Christina took over, right? And has just brought so much elegance and so much grace to the whole thing, and, and we all benefit from it. So let's just give a huge hand and a huge thank you and take nothing for granted. Can we just give a huge hand and a huge thank to Christina Amelon to Tahel? Like it's a big thank you in the chat box, right? Right? You get that? Like, wow, right? We take nothing for granted, right? As Suzette, right, organizes so much of what we're doing here today and, and Lady J, right, and London Jacqueline puts pieces together behind the scenes, right? And Jamie is starting to edit and, you know, which is, awesomely important and Benjamin's done so much important work and David who we're going to hear from today and Kirsten Zohar who's our co-executive producer and has held the executive director position and of course right Lady Christ who's kind of leading the charge and you know beloved Christina right and Shahat right and Claire who are kind of holding the space with us with Tom and with Terry so I just want you to feel and if I just, I just did it quickly in my mind that if I left someone out, just put them in the chat box, okay? Right, you know, so don't, right, don't worry about that. If I left someone out, right, total good, okay? So just put it in the chat box, anyone on the team, if I left someone out, right? But, right, can you feel that, everybody? Can you feel that, everyone? So there's so much goes to make this real, right? So much goes to make this happen, right? It's a big deal, our friend Don, right, invested, right, a big piece of funding, you know, a couple of years ago to put up the new site. And we all spend so much, and we're just getting started, Chris Marston stepping in to see if we can create some sort of podcast, right, short, it's so good to see you. But I just want everyone to get, right, this is our revolution, right, who are we? I want to set our intention. Who are we? What are we doing here? Why are we here? So Christina Amlon didn't do that Dharma recap for entertainment, although entertainment's great. It's not even wisdotainment, right? Wisdom as entertainment. I call that wisdotainment, right? What are we here for? We're here to make a fucking revolution because the world, right, is on the brink of suffering beyond imagination and potential utopia and flowering and flourishing of humanity beyond imagination. And we're poised between those two places and the road we take and what we do here can literally make all the difference, okay? That's why we're here. That's the reason to be here. So we're here because we're actually saying, we're not doing cute Sunday service and cute Sunday service is great. We love cute Sunday service. But that's not what we're here for. We're here in this place poised between utopia and dystopia to feel evolution awakening in us, as us and through us. To feel our capacity to gather the best knowledge that exists in the world, not just merely what's called merely subjective knowledge, not just fictions that are social constructions of reality, but first principles of value 
that actually undergird everything and tell us something about who we are, the nature of the universe, right? The universe story, our narrative of identity and, and why we're in this cosmos and why every decision we make is so urgent and why we're desperately needed by all of reality, right? Who, who are we? What are we about? Why are we here? It's only those first values and first principles that can respond to a pandemic. And we get used to reality so fast. How many people were here? Just can I ask you just a question? How many people were here four months ago when we did one breath because people were dying and couldn't breathe in the pandemic? How many people were here? Just, uh, just ask, right? How many people were here? How many people, right, right? Right, so here we are, right? So here's the crazy thing, okay? It's happening right now, so let's do it again. Because we forget how many of us have almost forgotten that it's happening because we get used to it. I remember, how many people remember, this is gonna date us. I remember being like a little kid, right? And watching on television in the mid seventies, the phalangist war in Lebanon between the Christian phalangists and the Islamic parties, this horrific war. And Lebanon, Beirut particularly, which was the, the jewel of the Middle East in many ways, Beirut was being utterly and radically destroyed. Does anyone remember that? Remember that mid seventies Beirut as that was going on? Who remembers it? We'll just date ourselves. Anybody? A few people? Or you maybe read about it, Inika, right? Right, right, Jack, and you remember that? And so do you remember? I remember watching it as a little kid and I remember seeing that there were like parties happening and birthday parties and romances and theaters. And so in the middle of bazookas and howitzers and explosions around the city, you had this kind of normal life. And if, and if you lived a few blocks out of the war zone, you kind of went on as normal. And I remember being shocked by it. I remember being shocked by it. But we can get used to anything, friends, right? Getting used to it is exactly what we don't want to do. We want to break that sense of the regular, of the routine in which we're dead, in which we're asleep. And we want to actually step into the center and we want to have a seat at the table. Right? And we're actually demanding a seat at the table. And you can do that today. We're demanding a seat at the table because we're saying we're going to be so committed. We're going to open our heart so deeply. We're going to be such outrageous lovers. We're going to read day and night. We're going to integrate. We're going to make that da Vinci move in Florence at that time between worlds and time between stories. And we're going to do it because it needs to be done. And we're self-appointed. Right? There is no one to appoint us. Right? There's no one to say, I bless you children, this is yours to do. No one appointed Da Vinci. No one appointed any set of iconoclasts and revolutionaries in the world. We do it because we feel the urgency of it and we feel the ecstatic urgency of it. It actually gives us great pleasure to have this privilege. And what are we doing? We're here to establish right, and to articulate a set of first principles and first values. Where I did my doctorate in Oxford, they're not doing it. My, my partner, Zach, he did his doctorate at Harvard. They're not doing it there. They're not doing it at Stanford. They're not doing it at the Sorbonne. Right? That's why we're not there. Right? Right? Universities today have become bastions of mediocrity, right? repeating right? old dogmas. They've been bastions, become bastions of the alt-left, just like certain dimensions of fundamentalism have become bastions of the alt-right. So you've got secularism on one side, which is devoid of spirit. Then you've got spirit hijacked by all forms of regressive religion on the other side. And neither of those are going to take us home. So we have to articulate a next move. Right? And friends, we are spirit's next move. And I know that's an audacious thing to say, but I want to say it. Right? We are spirit's next move. A secularism devoid of spirit in which all ultimate values are social constructions of reality. It's not spirit's next move. A regressive fundamentalism, right? It's not spirit's next move. Not spirit's next move, right? right? And, and actually, there's a fierceness to it. There's a fierceness to it, right? Like, wow, right? Right? Right. And it's, someone just wrote in the chat books, wow, how could we use the word fuck? Right. So we, <laughs> that's a very funny question. We just wrote a 15,000 word essay on that word. Right. And the word actually is a, it's an intensifier. Right. It captures an intensity. And occasionally we use it to capture that intensity. Right. Right. Like, wow. 
there's an intensity to it. It's not a degraded word, right? It's about the fierceness, right, of cosmos, but the fierceness of cosmos, right? So yes, I'm going to say again, it's a fucking revolution, right? Right? Not degraded revolution, right? No, no, that's not what it means. And to those of you who've studied with us, we wrote a 15,000 word essay, right, on the etymology of the word and what the word means and how that word actually intensifies a moment, right, and captures, right, a moment. And it's got nothing to do with sexuality. Nothing to do with sexuality. That's a later usage of the word, right? But that's a different conversation. So yeah, I want to just kind of completely honor you, right? Ad I think it was, who said that? Adele. Adele, thank you. Thank you, Adele, for your pointing out. And I apologize if that word was hard for you. And so I'm kind of giving you what, what the, the way were you, we were using it. So totally get that. Yay. Okay. So we in everybody? Are we in? Loving everybody. Are we in? Are we in all the way? Right? Are we in? Are we, can we feel all of us? Can we feel us? Adele, you with us? Right? Ariana, you good? We're ready to go. Can we blow this open? Let's, let's love it open. Right? Let's love it open. Let's feel all of us. And let's feel all of us together. And we can even have a conversation as we go, right? There's a fierceness to this, right? Guys, this is not a moment to get stuck on. We can say it this way. We can say it that way, right? And, and beautiful. And, and yes, love you, Adele. Love you madly. Beautiful, right? And, you know, Barbara, Barbara Mark Shepard and I, right, you know, you know, talked about this word, this word fuck. And when do we use it? And when don't we use it? And how do we use it? And how don't we use it? And what's polite and what's not polite? Right. And so, wow. Right. And Barbara actually started using the word as well. Right. Occasionally, once in a while, just to get the sense of like, oh, my God. Right. And actually, the words are parallel. God. Right. God. Right. This, it's a strange word. We don't know what it means. We don't use it all the time. We got to use it carefully. Right. And fuck. We don't use it all the time. We don't know what it means. We got to use it carefully. And Osho once gave a nice talk on this. Right? But it's, I, I want you to get the intensity of it. That's what I'm trying to say. This is not ordinary. Right? This is not like a, a new age gathering. Right? This is not let's get together and pat each other on the back. There's an insane urgency here of people who can't breathe all over the world. Right? There's an insane agony here right, of people who can't breathe all over the world. Right? Like, oh my God. Right? So I want to feel this with you. I want to feel this with you. Right? Right? So let's go. Let's go play, guys. Right? Let's get all the way in. And anyone who can't get all the way in, that's totally fine, too. Right? We're all good. Right? But let's, you know, and everyone will find their way in at the right time in the right way. And I'm glad there's a challenge. Because when there's no challenge, we can't wake up. Right? Feel discomfort. Right? Feel disconnect. And then go deeper. Right? And find it deeper and feel the urgency. And what's the urgency? What's the urgency? The urgency is a world without first principles and a world without first values. That's what the urgency is about. Right? It's like, oh my God, that is what the urgency is about. Right? Can we find that? Can you find that urgency? And that's, what, and that's why I borrowed that word because it holds the urgency. And, you know, at the end today, at the end today, you know, if you want to, Kirsten, if you have it, we can send and share with everyone, I don't know if it's online or not online, a link to the 15,000 word essay, right, literary essay that I wrote on, on this word, right, the, the importance of the word and the importance of the occasionally deploying it in order to engage the discomfort, right, to get out of our routine, to get out of the regular, right, to find our place, right? So let's find it. Let's find it. Yay. Yay. And, and again, with so much tenderness, right? With so much tenderness, right? When someone's uncomfortable, we hold that person with tenderness and love and we, we thank them, whoever it is, and we're all uncomfortable at different times. And then after the tenderness, this fierce commitment, right? This fierce Da Vinci commitment to articulate a new and gorgeous vision of reality. So I'm gonna ask everyone, if you've got a yes to stepping in, right, let's step in together. Let's step in together. We got a yes, give us a yes. If you've got a yes, if you're ready to step in and you're ready to blow this out, let's give us a yes. Let's step in all the way, all the way, like all the way, all the way, nothing left out, right? Because it's a decision, 
right? And it's, we step in even when we're disconnected. We step in even when we're uncomfortable. We step in, right, in order to come together and feel the urgency and the gorgeousness of this moment. And that's our intention. And it's a revolutionary intention, right? And, and wow, right, we're all so imperfect. We're all imperfect vessels for the light. And, and together, right, I know a thousand percent. And Barbara knows and knew, right, and is with us today in this second, right, a billion percent that we can actually become evolution, that we can actually turn this around, that we can actually articulate these first principles. So we're gonna do a huge first principle today, a huge, wondrous, wild first principle today. We're gonna to deepen what we did last week, right? And we can do this. We're gonna deepen what we did last week. So David, give it to us slowly and carefully, word by word, and just with all of your energy, give us the first principle of this week, right? Which is gonna take us inside, which is the first principle of, of prayer and what that means. So David, take us inside. Oh my God. Oh, oh my God. God. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark. Who is God? Where is God? Oh, question I'm asking every day. And this, this code really helps to clarify that, especially when we're lost. So I'm going to put it in the chat box here and we can all follow along. The God you don't believe in doesn't exist. God is not only, as she has been described by the great traditions, the infinity of power, but more profoundly, the infinity of intimacy. God is the infinity of intimacy, desiring finitude. Prayer is intimate communion between the divine and the human. It is true that human beings participate in divinity. This is the first person of the divine that lives in us. It is no less true that we are held by divinity in every moment. Every time we fall, we fall into she. This is the second person of the divine. Prayer is intimate communion between the infinity of intimacy and the intimacy of finitude. Finally, divine, divinity is the force of eros always seeking deeper coherence and wider intimacies from quarks to culture and beyond. This is the third person of divinity. And I turn my word back to you, Dr. Mark. Hey, David, thank you so much. And we're gonna be deep in this code. We're gonna be deep in this code all the way, okay? So to get into this code, let's just go the next step and do our practice of every week, which is Amor, A-M-O-R. And Amor means its insides are aligned with love. It's a verse from Solomon, from the Song of Solomon. And it's a description of the nature of reality. The nature of reality is its insides are aligned with love. Reality is moving towards deeper and deeper love, but reality is held together by eros in every second. It's bonds of allurement that hold separate parts in larger holes. And it's true on the molecular level, on the atomic level. And it's true on the level of biology, all of the life world, all of the world of matter. And it's true in the world of mind, in the human world. Right? All of reality is seeking more and more coherent intimacy. That's the plot line of reality. Reality has a plot line. It's not just moving from simplicity to complexity. That's the exterior of reality. These are first principles, right? We're getting them together. And if you're with us, then just write it with us in the chat box, right? Reality is not just simplicity to complexity, but what is complexity? Complexity means more, wider, deeper, coherent intimacies. The subatomic particles actually come together hadrons, right? Your hadron proton, right? Your quark, your lepton, right? They come together, they form an atom. The subatomic particles don't disappear, but they form a new whole, a new intimacy, a new configuration of intimacy, deeper than the sum of the parts. And reality is, and here's the sentence, reality is first principle. Reality is a progressive deepening of intimacies. Isn't that shocking? That's shocking, right? It's like, yeah, 
right? And whenever we feel not intimate for a second, right? We say, oh, I've, I've got to get intimate again. And that's why, and Adele, you were so gorgeous this morning, right? You're right. You heard a particular word. It evoked something which, which wasn't intimate in you. And you said, wow, I, I feel disconnected. And, and you brought yourself back in and you brought us all back in at a deeper level, like deepest bow and thank you, right? We, we keep, we choose to be intimate. We choose to step in. That's the movement of who we are, right? Reality is the progressive deepening of intimacies. That's what reality is. Evolution is the evolution of intimacy. And if you want to know in a word how Barbara Marks Hubbard and myself got together, it was Barbara heard this set of sentences on intimacy. And she said, oh my God, this is the missing piece. And we got together and we started talking. That's actually how it happened. Reality, it's not just simplicity to complexity. It's the progressive deepening of intimacies. So that movement of reality towards deeper intimacy, that's more. That's the love that lines reality. So take us in. Suzette, Christine, Amlon, right? Our, our practice, right? Every week, and let's just sing it all over the world and chant it amor. Amor. Its insights are aligned with love. Take us inside. Tom, Joyce, Adele. Amor, Rihanna, Randall. Amor, 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 amor. Gorgeous, gorgeous. So we're going to talk about, right, today we're going to talk about Amor, we're going to talk about prayer. And David, thank you for, for laying down that, that gorgeous code. And we're going to talk about one dimension of prayer this week. And then next week, we're going to try and put the whole thing together. Right next week, as we start, we're going to try and put it all together. And it'll be, you know, the first topic of our first principle conversation right? Prayer as a first principle of reality. But today we're at the end of August. It's August 30th, which is, it's a wonderful time. It's this time between times. Can everyone feel that? We're not quite in the summer. Who knows what the summer is in the middle, middle of the pandemic, right? But it's summer. We're about to step into the year and the year is different than we imagined it to be. And we're at this time in between. And it's a very special intimate time for us to be together. So I want to try and step into a a beautifully important, wildly gorgeous topic, right? Which is prayer. But I want to add a dimension to prayer that we've never talked about. Okay, everyone with us? Ready to go? We're ready to go. And I want to, I want to add something that's going to bring us into prayer. It's going to bring us into prayer. And, and it's, going to, I'm, it's going to explain, and I'm going to ask Krista or Kirsten if we can find all of the words for the Leonard Cohen hallelujah, so we can kind of see the whole 
because there's there's a couple of pieces that are are really important, right? Are really important that, we, that we're going to try and explain now, and that is prayer as protest. Okay, prayer as protest. Right, prayer as protest. Does everyone get that? Prayer as protest. Right, it's like ah, right. Not prayer as right. We talked about seven movements of prayer last week. I'm going to talk about prayer as protest and. Protest happens in, in many ways. Protest happens through humor, through laughter, and protest happens through demand, but there's, there's a revolution in prayer. And protest, right, when we're protesting, there's a protest that challenges divinity. Right? We don't only come to prayer as supplicants asking, pleading, but in the interior sciences, Prayer itself is a form of protest. And in the hidden lineages of the great traditions, not the superficial stuff that's caricatured as the great traditions. My colleague, Sam Harris, wrote a book called The End of Faith, in which essentially he caricatures accurately, but it's, it's a character of the exterior superficial dimensions, the shadows of the great traditions, but actually misses right, the depth of the interior sciences that the great traditions held. And in the great traditions, there were two forms of protest. When, when I actually challenge God, I challenge God as part of my revolution. I both partner with the divine, I'm divinity's evolutionary partner, and I'm protesting. So I'm partner and protest at the same time. So one form of protest, and, I'm gonna, and these are deeply related, is laughter. So I'll tell you a joke. Anyone up for a joke? But this is a, this is a, it's a deep joke. Okay, we ready? We ready? Okay, so here we go. So this righteous man dies and he's this super righteous, like wild, deep guy, right? And, and he's so righteous. He's so good. He's such a great master that he literally goes right to the highest heaven, goes to the highest heaven. And there he is before God. And so God says, well, so what can I do for you? He says, well, you know, can I tell you a joke? And God says, a joke? Like no one had ever said that to God. So God says, sure, I guess tell me a joke. So this righteous man tells God a Holocaust joke. Like it's a joke about the Holocaust. Like, <gasps> right, tells God a Holocaust joke. And God says, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. I just, I just don't get it. And the guy says to God, you had to be there. You had to be there. Wow. Who got that? Who got that? Who got that, right? Oh my God, who got that? Who got that? Who got that? If you got that, if you got it right, yes. Do you get it? It's like, wow. And then do you get how many layers there is to this? Do you get how many layers? Right? God doesn't get the Holocaust joke. And so the, the master says to God, you have to be there. Wow. You have to be there. Now, get the paradox in this. This is deep. And we're, we're deep in this together here. Right? We're in this revolution. We're going to add a piece. So the caricature of religion that Sam Harris or, you know, his whole gang, Chris Hitchens and, and, and Yuval Harari and Richard Dawkins, you know, the whole, right, they caricature religion. Religion has many shadows, but spirit is much more subtle. And the great traditions, right, at their best had an enormous amount of subtlety that we need to actually transcend and include. We need to create a new language of spirit. We need to create new subversive vocabularies that are first principles. And we need to weave together pre-modern, modern, and post-modern into a new larger whole. But we can't just throw out pre-modernity. They didn't just get it wrong. The great traditions had and still have something wildly important, right? Which is this, this notion of paradox. And whenever you've had a mystical experience, which means you've had a genuine direct access and experience of the absolute truth and goodness of spirit and the self-evident goodness of reality itself, right? And the truth of love and the truth of the value of goodness, truth, and beauty. Whenever you have a mystical experience, one of the characteristics of a mystical experience is, anybody? Paradox. It's paradox, right? It's paradox. Did everyone get paradox? Everyone get the word paradox? Okay. 
So it's paradoxical. How could you use the word fuck in the middle of a holy right, conversation? And how could fuck be holy? Paradoxical. We're not going to talk about it. It's not our topic, but it's paradox. What's the difference between a paradox and a contradiction? Anybody? What's the difference between a paradox and a contradiction? In a contradiction, A is the opposite of B, and you can't resolve them. It's either one's right or the other's right. In a paradox, we hold both of them together. Does that make sense, everybody? Can, you, can we hold that? And in a paradox, we hold both of them together, right? Does that make sense? We got that? Right? There's no split, right? We're holding it together. So in this joke we just told, right, both are true at a higher level of consciousness. All right, so that's a paradox. So I'll just give you an example. I'll give you an example. So how many people are here? And it's a great example, right? If it works for you, okay? We good? We good, everybody? Everybody good? Just, just give a check and let's find each other, okay? Let's find each other. We're good? Okay, okay. And just to know, I just gonna, can I just share something? Is that okay? If I just share this uh, a little tender thing about me? You know, there's a part of me that's very audacious. And there's a part of me that's just so wants to love and take care of everyone. So there's still a little part of me, Adele, that's still holding you and wanting to take care of you and make sure you're okay, love. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just loving you. So you're still, you're still in me. Okay, yay. But I'm just finding you and loving you and just, just feeling you. Okay, so you just can feel me feeling you. Okay, yay. Okay, we together, everybody? So let's do this. So here's paradox. How many people who are here decided made a decision. I could have done 10 things this morning, but I made a decision to be here. How many people feel like, wow, I made that decision. I made a decision, right? I could have done a lot of different things. I made a decision to be right, right? I didn't have to be here, but I decided, I decided to be here. And that's true. That's obviously, there's a great truth to that. But here, here's another truth. Another truth is you didn't decide at all, right? You were being lived. It's deeper than that, David, right? You were being lived by reality. This is yours to do. It's, it's the place where you need to be. And all of your life and all of my life brought us to be together in this revolution this morning, right? right? And it's, it's what I like to call choicelessness, right? It decided me. So on the one hand, I decided, right? Obviously, I decided, right? right? I mean, obviously, I had many choices. I'm an autonomous being. I'm a separate self with free will, and I made a decision. But at some deeper level, the reason we know each other, the reason we're together, the reason we're in this revolution, the reason we're the ones making this commitment, the reason ones we're taking responsibility is because something larger than us is living us and it's beyond choice. We actually have no choice. We have to do this. We can't walk away. And even when we're exhausted and we feel like, oh my God, let's just write, right, right? But there's this larger mystery in which we're beyond choice. Can you feel that? How many people can feel that? Now, is this a crime? How many, I'm going to just check in. Who can feel it? But that's, that's a first person moment of enlightenment, right? On the one hand, there's a contradiction. What's the contradiction? Well, either I chose to be here or I didn't choose to be here. One way or the other, you can't have both. Right? That's, a, that's the level of contradiction. But then in a mystical experience, I reach a deeper level of consciousness where I'm actually holding, right, contradiction, right? I chose and I didn't choose. And if you find the most important movements in your life, Beloved Oriana, you actually begin, right, friend, right, Mosa, you begin to realize every place I've been, I needed to be. You get that? And it couldn't have been any different. Okay, that's paradox. So in this joke, what is this joke holding? And that's what laughter does. Laughter holds paradox. And this is big. And this is big. It's deep. It's a deep principle, right? We generally think of there being, okay, we together, we think of there being five senses in reality, five senses. But actually in the first principles of the interior sciences, there are 12 senses. And what is a sense? What's a sense? A sense gives you access to a dimension of reality that the, the other sense doesn't give you. So fragrance, smell tells me something about reality, right? Touch tells me something, out, something else about reality, right? Auditory, I can hear, tells me something else. It gives me access to a different layer of reality. Seeing, gives me access to a different layer of reality, tasting, right? The five senses. But there are more than five senses. We actually have other ways of accessing reality. So the 12th sense, it's called the 12th sense in a mystical book about 100 years before the common era called the book of creation. It's got about 450 words. It's one of the most important texts ever written. It talks about these 12 senses. 
And the highest of the 12 is laughter. Wow. Right? So laughter, right, is a faculty that allows me to access reality in a way that nothing else does. We, we together so far? We good? Okay. So we just told a joke. Now, what's the paradox in this joke? Right? Everyone, everyone get the paradox? The, the joke has so many levels and it's so subtle. It's so good. What's the paradox in the joke? Anybody? Right? He's there. He's this righteous man. He's a master. Right? He ascends to the highest heaven. Right? He's talking to God. Right? And then he tells him a joke, a Holocaust joke, which is, you know, ultimately not cool. Holocaust jokes are not cool. They're not funny. I have one friend who I'm very close to. I won't say his name. He's a well-known person who once told me a Holocaust joke. And I said, if you ever do that again, I'm never talking to you again. Some things you don't joke about, right? But he's there before the divine and he decides, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, there's nothing else I can do. I got to tell a joke. And then God doesn't get it. He says to God, you have to be there, right? So what, what, what's the joke about? The joke is about evil. It's about how can there be infinitely good God and a boy hanging on the gallows, right? In Auschwitz every day, right? And 12,000 people gassed a day in 1944. How, how can those hold together? But yet on the inside, we don't explain suffering. We never do. We can never explain suffering. We can't. Anyone who tells you they can explain suffering, new age, right? New age, thousand explanations in the new age to suffering. Anyone who tells you they're going to explain to you suffering, they're going to work out the contradiction between infinite goodness and human suffering, walk away. Don't trust them, walk away. You can't explain suffering. But you can actually, when you're in the relationship, when you're in, when you're on the inside of the inside, your heart's ripped open, you can actually be speaking to God directly and say, you have to be there. Now that makes no sense, right? It makes no sense. It's a paradox. That's mystical realization. Can you hear that everybody? I mean, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's gorgeous, right? Did I just lose everyone? That's super subtle. That's like a super advanced, right? Mystical understanding. How many people got it? I have just, if you got it, just say yes. If you didn't, if you don't ask a question about it. Okay. But it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's subtle. It's everything. It's this joke about a master, right? Who goes to God and said, right? You had to be there. Wow. Wow. Right? So there's a dimension of prayer, which is protest. Protest. Right? Protest. Right? God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Right? One of my, 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 fa you know, my, my favorite prayers. It's, it's a very subtle prayer, right? Is mimkumcha malkenu tofia. God, from your place, appear. Vatim lo right? And, 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 and be the king. Ki mechakim anachnulach, because we're waiting for you. Matai, when will you come already? Can you feel that? Right? There's a protest in that we're waiting for you. Where are you? All right? Wow. Wow. I'll give you another prayer. It's a famous prayer that many people have written major essays about. You may have heard about it. You may not have. It's called the Kaddish prayer. K-A-D-D-I-S-H. Can everyone write that in the chat box? Is that okay? Kaddish. All right. How many people have never heard of Kaddish? Give me a no if you've never heard of it. I'm sure most people have it. But if you've never heard of it, right? No, 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 no. Fantastic. Great. So that's awesome. Thank you. No, right. so, so Kaddish is a prayer. It's a, it's a prayer in Aramaic, which is said when a person has died. So when a person dies, we say the Kaddish prayer. And it's Aramaic. It's all Aramaic. And it's a mystical prayer. The only thing is, the Kaddish prayer doesn't say anything about death. And in Raquel, there's, look up Kaddish, and you'll see some gorgeous essays. Leon Wiestler, I can never pronounce his name, wrote a couple of gorgeous essays on Kaddish, right? It's an incredible, but, but Kaddish is this prayer you say when a person dies, but it doesn't talk about death. And the words of the prayer are, Yitgadel magnified and exalted will be your name in the future. 
Oh, isn't God's name magnified and exalted and perfect right now? And why is it in the future? Because death, death is in some sense a violation of divinity. Death is painful. Death rips our hearts out. And yes, there's life beyond death. And yes, there's continuity of consciousness. But death itself in some profound way contradicts divinity. Right? And I've got to hold the contradiction and turn it into paradox. That's what prayer does. Can you feel that? Right? I hold the contradiction. I turn it into paradox. And so the prayer is, it's an Aramaic. And it's, in the future, God. In the future. Right? Your name is going to be magnified. But now in the face of death, there's something empty about your name. So God, right? God, show up. Show up. Be here. Right? Turn your silence of presence into a full presence of speech. Right? We demand. We demand your partnership. So prayer's audacious. Right? Prayer's audacious. Can everyone feel this? Right? There's this new dimension of prayer. Let's take it deeper. Can we take it deeper? Can we take it one step deeper? We okay? Can we okay? Okay, let's go deeper. Let's go even deeper in. I want to get this dimension of prayer. So once a year in the lineage tradition, let's say, of Hebrew wisdom, out of which Christianity emerged and Islam emerged, right, and, and it had enormous impact on reality, there's a, a day of the year which is called Yom Kippur. It was the day of atonement. And that's the day where everyone comes and prays, right? And people pray for hours and hours and hours, 25 hour kind of prayer fest, right? It's this ecstatic prayer fest for 25 hours of, of complete joy, okay? Complete joy. So again, this, this is nothing to do. This doesn't need to be your tradition. I'm borrowing this from the Hebrew lineage tradition to model something, okay? So that doesn't matter whether this is your tradition or not your tradition. That's not the point. This is a universal principle. Okay, so everyone's with us? Okay. So people will come and they're, they're completely brokenhearted. Right? And Yom Kippur, and, but they know that actually they can meet the infinite love of reality. And literally, and this is a, such a, one of the most profound ideas in the world, the reason it's complete joy, because you know that you're already forgiven. You come to Yom Kippur and you can actually get on Yom Kippur underneath the space-time continuum and recommit your life to your unique self. And simply by recommitting your life and regretting any past, right? Oriana, right? I just, I regret any past mistake that any of us have made with true regret and true commitment into the future, right? There's a mystical formula that literally underneath the space-time continuum actually obliterates the past. It doesn't exist anymore. You've actually reconfigured the past and that's the joy. Right? The joy is the ability to reconfigure the past, and that's a different conversation. It's a very deep idea. What does it mean to get underneath the space-time continuum? But it's not just a woo-woo idea. It's a, it's a very profound idea in physics now. We're actually realizing the space-time continuum is, is a dimension of reality, but that we can actually go deeper. And consciousness is underneath the space-time continuum. That's what Young Kipper's about. Okay, everyone with me so far? Because that's just, that's just the context. With that context, let's dive in. Okay, and then we're going to pray. This is our context for prayer today. So with that context, I'll just tell you a short story. Here's the story. So it's Yom Kippur Eve, and everyone's gathered at the prayer hall of the great Hasidic master named Levi Isaac of Berdichev. And if you know about Foucault and Derrida, Derrida particularly, the great postmodern deconstructive thinker, he loved Levi Isaac of Berdichev and actually writes about him. So Levi Isaac of Berdichev, Berdichev is the name of his town, right? He's gathering, right, to pray. And, and it's packed. Everyone's there and they're in full joy. And, and they're there ready to offer up their, their prayers. And then, and now stay with me, in the middle, in walks this man, who everyone knows never comes to the, the prayer hall. And he pushes his way through and he goes to the front and he stands by the holy ark and he grabs the curtain and he he mumbles like a few sentences. Then he says, I'm done. Let me know if we have a deal. And walks out. And, and everyone wants to grab him. They're furious with him. I mean, they're utterly crazy furious with him. Does everyone get this? They're completely furious with him. Okay? All right, and I say, stay close. Okay, stay close. Stay close. Stay close. Peter, stand with us. 
Ultimately, death doesn't contradict divinity, but you got to hold the contradiction for a moment and move it into paradox. But stay inside, everyone, okay? Let's stay inside. Let's stay in the story together. Okay, so, so this man's now walked out, and everyone's trying to grab him to stop him, and he's kind of violated the sanctity of the day, and they can't understand. You know the word chutzpah? Anyone's got the word chutzpah? Put it in the chat box. Chutzpah, C-H-U-T-Z-P-A. Chutzpah meaning arrogance, right? And what kind of arrogance is this? And how can he walk in on the holiest day of the year and, and pray these few sentences and then say, do we have a deal? Whatever that meant, and walk out. And so people are furious with him. And 25 hours later, at the end of the holy day, right, the master, the great master, the lady, Isaac of Bridgetchev says, get me that man. I desperately need to talk to him. And everyone's like, why does he want to talk to this arrogant man who came in and violated the sanctity of the day? And so they go and find him. And they bring him before Levi Isaac. And friends, open your hearts. Let's open our hearts together. Levi Isaac says to this man, he says, you've got to be my teacher. I've never seen anyone pray with the confidence that you prayed. You must tell me your prayer. You must tell me your prayer. Wow. And the man says to Levi Isaac, he says, I'll tell you my prayer. It's very simple. I said to God, God, you know, I've made some mistakes this year. You know, there were a couple of weights and measures I didn't do exactly right. And there were times I got angry that I should have, and I, I got a little contracted, and I, I'm sorry for that. And I didn't always get to fulfill all of the rituals. And there's times I should have been just a tad sweeter. And God, I, I really, I want your forgiveness. But God, you've had a terrible year. The woman who lives two doors down from me, her husband, right, died in the middle of the night. And she's left with four children. Right, and two blocks over, right, there's the woman who lives by herself, right, with three children, and one of them is sick, and she can barely put food on the table, and she's racked with anxiety every day. And, and this man went through the list of people suffering intensely in Brodichev. And He says, God, you've had a bad year, but you know what? I'm willing to work with you. Let's make a deal. You forgive me, and I'll forgive you. Do we have a deal? And he walked out. Wow, 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 can you hear that? And Levi Isaac looks in his eyes and he says, never has a more holy prayer ever been prayed. But my friend, he says with tears in his eyes, you made only one mistake. You prayed only for yourself and not for the whole world. Had you prayed for the whole world, the whole world would have been instantly liberated in one moment. Can you hear that, friends? That's prayer as protest. That's demanding something from God. Wow, prayer as protest. It's a complete paradox. We come before God with our holy broken hallelujah. And if you listen to Leonard deeply, and we're gonna go and pray right now, we're gonna just one other thing before we finish there, we're gonna pray and we're gonna offer prayers together. But if you listen deeply to the holy and the broken hallelujah, you'll actually feel the protest. Hallelujah is a joke, the word. Hallelujah means, as we've shared here before, but now you'll get the paradox in it. Hallelujah means, on the one hand, pristine praise of the perfect God. But hallelujah also means, right, drunken, wild laughter, revelry, and the great joke, right? So I come to God in the laughter, and, and, and in my broken hallelujah, and even though it all went wrong, I stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my lips but hallelujah. So hallelujah is, on the one hand, right, we fall into the arms of the divinity who holds us in every second, the second person of cosmos. The first principle is the personhood of cosmos. God is third person, the laws of physics. First person, the God who lives in me, but the personhood of cosmos, the infinity of intimacy. But in that intimacy, there's protest. In a genuine intimacy, there's protest, right? No, no, God, it can't be this way. And God, we're so intimate. God, I love you so madly. I can't allow for this pandemic. And God, you've got to heal it. And God, you've got to fix it. And yes, God, we're going to be revolutionaries. And yes, we're going to be activists. And yes, we're going to evolve the source code. And yes, we're going to articulate the new first principles. But you've got to be there with us. And we demand your presence. We demand 
that you hold our hands. We demand that you heal the world. We demand that you partner with us. And we can't do it without you and you can't do it without us. And we are protesting, right, every tear. And we're protesting every person who can't breathe. And God, we are with you one breath and let your name be magnificent magnified and exalted because in this moment right now you are absent god you didn't get the joke because you weren't there be there god and of course in that moment of the void we know that 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 the silence is a silence of presence we know that as we scream those words right divinity is speaking through us and in god is more present in the apparent absence than than he or she it the infinity of intimacy ever was right? It's not a silence of absence, right? It's a silence of presence. And the voice of protest is the voice of the divine speaking through us, right? And evil is a failure of intimacy. And it's only when we restore the intimacy in the act of protest that we can actually be revolutionaries. So we're not revolutionaries in the Marxist sense, which we're stepping away from the divine. We're revolutionaries in this new sense in which actually our lives are protest. We offer our lives as protest, prayer as protest, prayer as holy audacity, prayer as God, let's make a deal. And God, this is a deal you can't refuse because we need you and you need us. And the time is now an admatai until when? Until when? Until when? Admatai until when? Right, it's gotta end now, right? We protest and you know what? You know what divinity does when we protest? Smiles. God laughs. God gets the joke. And we get the joke together. And in that power of our laughter together, we move to transform reality. So let's step inside, right, to the holy and the broken hallelujah. And then we're going to come together. We're going to pray for just a couple minutes. We're going to offer up prayers. But we're going we're gonna to find this new chord in the symphony of the first principle of prayer, prayer is protest. Let's go all the way inside, right? The holy, right? And the broken, hallelujah. Protest itself, Leonard Cohen. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. Together, all of us, but all over the world. really care for music, do you?
didn't come to fool you. And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. find it in the chat box, friends, every prayer, right? Right? Let's open up to it. Prayer as protest. I ask for everything, but it's got this dimension now. I just want to ask you before we pray, right? Can you feel that dimension of protest in Cohen? You can't understand the song without it. You can't understand it without it. It's impossible to understand. You can't understand Cohen without it. Cohen is in this tradition of protest, right? He's in this lineage of Levi Isaac of Bredichev. It's where he's writing from. So let's pray as protest. So, right, God help me, right? I need you, right? Shahati, first prayer, right? And right, right, Bonnie, I pray for the lifting of all minds and hearts to the presence of love, our mother, father, God. Yes, Suzanne, prayer, stop the suffering. Kirsten, prayer, be our partner, God, goddess, in all our outrageous love of evolution, right? Suzanne, stop the killing. Right, Peter Gimmon, my prayer is for all of us to receive, give, and be the blessing of the Father. Right? Right. And just write that beautiful, gorgeous prayer. Just, just feel in the prayer. It's not so much the words, it's the energy of it. Right? Meaning, meaning it's the God in us. We're not against God in it. Right? It's the divine voice itself that's protesting through us. Right? Shot, help me. Help the world with all us revolutionaries. Right? Right? Shot, Krista, God, stop the pain. Liberate the fathers. Liberate the daughters. Heal the pain. Stop the drama. Set us free now from the chains of the past. Raquel, Raquel, I pray that God transform the crucial issue of age. Right? And, but, but Raquel, as protest, God, I protest. Right? The crucial issue of age in the context of romantic sexual love. I'm committed to helping. Right? Protest. It shouldn't be that way. Let's make it new, right? Stop envy, right? Harry, I pray for you, God, to end all the suffering at last, right? Can you feel it, Harry? Right? When Harry adds the word at last, right? He adds this dimension of protest, right? Jackie, I dare to pray for power, courage, strength, wisdom, clarity to do my part to stop the suffering. Yes, God, be here now. We need you. God, end the suffering, right? Let your breath enter all of us, right? Benjamin, Enoch, I pray right, for all the fleeing people in the world, right, right, I pray against the status, right, right, effing quo, says David, hold the best, throw the rest out, Bonnie, cast out the violence and negative vibrations, right, bind all violence, prayer as protest, right, it's the essence of power, right, says Ken, right, yes, right, Paul, Make this world a sane world. Remove the power abuse of all bad actors and any part of us that's ever a bad actor. Tom, I pray that you ease the obstacles to intimacy at both the global and personal levels. I pray, right, Myra, for the world's evolution, right? Help us, the world, God, right? Suzanne, learn everyone, that everyone is equal, right? Right, Legia, right, God, be with us. Stop the loneliness, Adele, right? Pray for courage to stay present right, to the feeling of absence, right, enough love to keep doing my best, right, to bring trust and the power of your love to make a difference now, right, can everyone feel it, right, and Beth, right, I'm here, God, hear me, right, hear me, stop the injustice, Claire, right, stop, right, help us bring truth, beauty, and goodness in the world, right, wild women, I pray for outrageously powerful chutzpah for my world's and unique gift to blow open everything, right, I pray for the health of my daughter, now, God, Right now, God, and you understand that now God's not against God, right? It's the ultimate 
place where humility and audacity, right, come together and let the prayers enter you. Oriana, beautiful Oriana, I pray to hold the whole world as one heart, comforting the heart of all, right? Ken, speak to me in ways I cannot misunderstand. Let me know you're here, right? At last, oh my God, stop the hunger, right? God, stop the zero-sum game, right? Writes Morgan in her prayer, right? In his prayer, let all of us, he, she, right? That when we lift each other up, we're all lifted higher than we can possibly imagine, right? And the prayers go on, right? God, Joyce sang, we need you. And Joyce puts right now, right now, right now, right? And Joyce, right? We have our symphony of Joyce's, right? Joyce, Palafi, right? Right now, God, keep us safe from the fires, right? Now, 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 right? Prayer as protest. So we've added the subtle dimension to prayer right now, right now, 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 right now, right? Yes. So thank you, everyone. All right? Thank you. Deepest bow. And we lift these prayers to the sky. We lift these prayers to the sky. Right? Wow. And then from that place, here's the last minute. And then we're going to bring everyone together and we're going to start our after you know, short meeting and check in and say hello to each other. But in the middle of this, in the middle of this protest is prayer, what do we do? Right in the middle of this protest is prayer. Right, and right, you ready for everybody? Right, ready? Okay, and Chris is gonna talk to us at the beginning of the meeting. Everyone, Chris is gonna talk to us at the very beginning of the meeting, right, of, of how we can get involved and, you know, we're getting lots of questions, right, a lot going on. Now stay clear, okay? In the middle of this protest, we turn to the divine and we say, and we say, and anyone can put the words in the chat box. We say, Mizmor Shir Le'Yom Shabbat. God, it's good to sing with thee. Right, Peter? We're, we're in the paradox. To speak of your love in the morning and to trust you through the night. To speak of your love in the morning and to trust you through the night. Radical trust and protest. To speak of your love in the morning and to trust you through the night. To speak of your love in the morning and to trust you through the night. Mizmor Shir Leyom Shabbat. All of us together, it's good to sing with thee, God. To speak of your love in the morning and to trust you through the night and we protest and we demand and we say now right and we ask for everything and we demand everything it's only that kind of relationship with divinity that can avoid the emptiness of secularism and its empty dogma and the dogmatism and emptiness of a fundamentalism that has all the answers right there's two dogmas. There's a dogma of secularism that ignores an enormous amount of evidence. And there's a dogma of fundamentalism that ignores an enormous amount of mystery. We got to bring those two together. We're up there and we're in the highest heavens. We're with the divine. We're madly in love. We speak of her love in the morning and we trust her in the night and we protest and we act and we act as God. We protest to God even as we're madly in love with the divine as she lives in us and as she holds us in every moment. Let's put Krista on speaker view. All right, and Krista, we'll turn to Krista to welcome us. And let's give Krista in the chat box a huge welcome, our lead executive producer, who's kind of leading the charge and anyone who wants to get involved in the charge, find Krista. Let's welcome Krista. Let's give Krista a big hand. Welcome, yay. Rockstar, welcome. Take us inside, sister, yay. Thank you, thank you, Mark. How exciting to see all of our faces. I have been looking forward to this moment all week because this is what it's about for me, to see each other, to feel each other, to hear each other's voices, to actually 
get to know each other. And I'm scrolling through this, these pages right now to, to see all of us. And this is my invitation for you as well. Um, the last few weeks, there has been an emergence of ideas and inspiration coming from all of us as a co-creation to actually create beautiful, beautiful things for our global communion here. And one thing that I am and together with me, a lot of people are excited about is, is this, creating spaces where we get to not only receive the first principles, but also do the first practices together, where we get to see eye to eye and feel each other, hear each other, and actually integrate this amazing Dharma into our daily lives. So one of the beautiful ways to do that is to join our um, writing group. Every Monday, me and Christina Amelong, we host this amazing writing group where we write to the evolutionary love code. So today the evolutionary love code was all about prayer. So tomorrow we are going to integrate that and through writing, actually make it our own and see what wants to come through. So that is a beautiful space where you are invited to join us. It's at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, which is 8 p.m. European time. And um, after our writing, we give each other feedback, we share with each other, and we actually get to know each other. And there's beautiful deep transformation happening there. So I'm looking forward to meet all of you there. And um, the next thing is that we also share our um, writings as outrageous love letters on our Facebook page. And I'm actually not sure if I'm going to be able to share the screen here. I'm going to try that. Um, here it is, might actually work, yes. So this is our Facebook page, Outrageous Acts of Love, because we are a band of outrageous lovers and we are committed to receive the outrageous love here in our gathering every week, but then to bring it out into the world by committing outrageous acts of love. And then we write our stories on this Facebook page here to inspire each other, to show each other, look, this is what is happening. This is the outrageous act of love that I committed this week to be proud of each other, to celebrate each other's greatness and inspire each other to love the world open more and more and more. So here's James sharing in a video his beautiful outrageous love letter. So just after church, check out this Facebook page and read the stories, look at the beautiful clips, and you are invited to participate in that as well. So if you click here on the community page, that's where all of you can post. So if you see something beautiful in the world, it can be your own outrageous acts of love, but maybe you read a story on the internet or your friend is telling you a story. You can write that story there and put a beautiful picture there. So I invite all of us to step in in this amazing way and to become part of this revolution by sharing your outrageous acts of love on this Facebook page. And then I will move on to our uh, websites and here are the beautiful courses that Mark Gaffney has created together with also Becoming a Future Human. I know some people are right now watching on Facebook on Barbara Marks Hubbard's Facebook page. This is a course that is actually created, created together with Barbara Marks Hubbard. All of these courses contain hours and hours of transmission of the amazing Dharma that we are also receiving here in our weekly service, but this actually gives you the opportunity to deeply study the Dharma and to really go deep with it and make it your own. So each of these courses, the investment for them are $297. But actually right now, and actually only for this week, this is the last week that you are going to be able to receive this gift from us. You will get all of these nine courses if you step in to become a member. And becoming a member of our One Love, One Communion starts, you can choose your own contribution, but it already starts from only $25 a month. So if you sign up before next week, Sunday, you will receive nine amazing in-depth courses for only $25 a month. And after that, we will start our um, next phase of our revolution and evolve into new, new structures. So this is the um, last opportunity for that. And of course, becoming a part of this revolution, of this communion is for you to, to feel part of it, to co-create with us, but it's also an amazing way to make your contribution and to help us grow this communion and make 
more investments to reach more people and to do more work. So I'm really excited to be here together with all of you. And with that, I give my word back to you, beloved Mark. Fantastico. So how are we going to end? How are we going to end? How are we going to end here, Krista? Do we have a, we have a chant? We have a song? Do we have a, what's our, what's our suggestion here? 